Hi friends, I'm Amy Julia Becker, and this is Love is Stronger Than Fear, a podcast about pursuing hope and healing in the midst of personal pain and social division. If you're listening to this episode right when it comes out, you will know that we are nearing the end of 2021. Maybe you're thinking about New Year's resolutions, or maybe you're thinking about how you refuse to make those types of resolutions. Maybe you're enjoying lists of best books or albums or movies. It's in that spirit that I want to offer you a rerun of one conversation from this past year. Uh, One of the conversations that was most listened to and also I think most appreciated in the course of this past year, it's my conversation with Oshita Moore, author of Dear White Peacemakers. This book, Dear White Peacemakers, came out at exactly the right time. It's a book about compassionate anti-racism, anti-racism that really looks at the way of love and peace and grace, that looks at the way of Jesus as a guide through the social unrest and turmoil that we've been experiencing in our nation in these recent years. Oshida's book came out at exactly the right time, and it's still the right time for all of us to consider how to be peacemakers, not peacekeepers, not people who affirm the status quo, people who are peacemakers in a world of conflict and division. So I'm grateful to get to listen to this conversation again. I hope you will also enjoy it again or perhaps for the first time. Today, I have the honor of talking with Ashita Moore. She is the author of the about-to-be-released and truly phenomenal book, Dear White Peacemakers. Ashita, welcome. Hi, Amy Julia. Thanks for having me. I have been looking forward to this interview for longer than you even know, because (laughs) I've been looking forward to it the whole time that I've been reading your book, but I was first introduced to you through your Dear White Peacemakers podcast series. Oh, and then right. I found you on Instagram. And so about a year ago or last summer, I really wanted to get you on the podcast. But then I found out you were writing this book. And I said, Oh, okay, I'll wait. I'll wait. Um, <laughs> so I really have been wanting to talk to you for a long time, not only for my own sake, but also for our listeners sake. Um, it's really a gift to get familiar with your work. And I'm grateful for what you do. I want to start with asking you to introduce yourself and especially just talking about how you found yourself in the particularly pastoral role that you're in. So tell us about you yeah. and about your ministry, really. Yeah. So hi. Um, okay. So I live in St. Paul, Minnesota. I love it here. Never want to leave St. Paul. I'm originally from Texas, though, so I'm a Southern girl at heart. Um, and I live here with my husband, who's a pastor. He pastors a small congregation. Um, in St. Paul. And then I have three teenagers. So my oldest is 18, then I have a 15 year old and then a 14 year old. So two boys and a girl. Um, Mm. And um, yeah, I've been so, you know, a little bit about, I guess, my ministry is I really started blogging back, you know, I think maybe like 12 years ago, 12, 15 years ago, um, because my husband and I would have these like really intense conversations and I had all these emotions and all these opinions. And one day he was just like, um, you have a lot of words about a lot of things. I think you need to start a blog. And I was like, no, 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 no. I don't need to start a blog because I was so, I, my husband is really active online and I was so scared of just the divisive. And like, if we think things are, I mean, things are terrible right now, but things were pretty bad online, you know, mm. 10, 10, 15 years ago, where it just, um, you know, I think people were really into call out culture, really, really into so calling out somebody taking them down. Mm. There was just a lot of conflict online. I was like, I don't want to be a part of that because the faith tradition I'm a part of is rooted in nonviolence and peacemaking. Um, And I was like, I just I I don't even see how I can show up in that online space. And so what I what I decided was that if I was going to start doing any kind of online work, writing online, that I was going to have a distinctly peacemaking um, voice rooted around the, the Hebraic concept of shalom. And um, I define shalom as God's dream for the world as it should be. Nothing broken, mm-hmm. nothing missing, everything made whole, which means that God desires us to live in harmony with each other. And so I will do my best to seek peace and be at peace with others, especially in my writing. Um, and at that point, my husband and I were planting a church in Boston, long story, mm-hmm. and it was a peace church. And so there's just a lot of like things I could write online about 
peacemaking and actually like asking myself the question, what if Jesus actually meant it? Like if Jesus actually calls us to be peacemakers, what does that look like? And how does that look in our everyday life? So I started that um, writing and then I ended up writing my first book, Shalom Sisters, which is really just a, an exploration of everyday peacemaking for women. Um, and, um, for, and in that book, I noticed that I wrote a lot about um, the intersection of my identity as a black woman and the current racial climate in our country and my call to be a peacemaker. There are a couple chapters in Shalom Sisters where I touched on how peacemaking and nonviolence comes up as I do that work. And I just realized that a huge part of Shalom begins with seeking peace in myself um, mm -hmm. and peace with God. And so I can't be at peace with myself and my brown skin um, if I don't have conversations about systems of the world that make it hard for me to thrive. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't be at peace with God if I don't believe that God didn't make a mistake in giving me my brown skin. Um, and so just coming to that place and doing that work of being really comfortable as a black woman, um, having these conversations, I really went back to that place and that I began writing a line saying, if I'm gonna do this work, I'm gonna do this work from a peacemaking nonviolent perspective especially when I'm talking about these kinds of hard topics with white people. And I just kind of found myself in a bunch of conversations where I would talk about my journey with race and race conciliation as a black woman and white people would be interested in those conversations with me. And I just found myself kind of in this pastoral space where I'm talking about things that they maybe heard or learned from other people, but helping them break it down and ultimately like reminding them of their belovedness and their importance in this work to where I found myself like just really having a deep heart for making sure that white people recognize in the same way that I need to be at peace with myself and I need to be at peace with my God, that white people doing this work need to be at peace with themselves mm -hmm. and their belovedness knowing that God didn't make a mistake in giving them their European features. Right. Right. Um, and so that's really where that kind of aspect of my ministry kind of came up. Then I started doing this thing online where I would uh, write to Dear White Peacemakers, which was my intentional way of calling in um, white people saying, you matter to me. So dear, white, dear, and then white, like it's important for you to be able to, to be at peace with yourself and say like, God, you make a mistake in the way he made me. And also because I'm white in this country that's in the middle of this racial reckoning, I have a unique role and have a unique calling um, to engage with it because of because of the, my ethnic identity. Um, and so in my book, I try really hard to neutralize the idea of white and also say like, there's nothing wrong with being white, where I think in other places there that's been pejorative or an attack. And then peacemakers really like goes back to the calling that I feel um, that I wanna invite them in to understand the nature of this work is making peace, not, not being peacekeepers. So we are actively binding up brokenness and filling in systems of, or, uh, resisting systems of oppression and that's doing peacemaking work together. And so I can't do peacemaking work with you if I don't choose to live at peace with you. So that's kind of like how all of that came together. And so my husband's a pastor of a small church. I'm actually, I pastor alongside with him but then I pastor at a larger church as, a, as outreach and teaching pastor here in the Twin Cities too. So I, yeah. you know, teach and then I also lead classes on these concepts of anti-racism, the love of community and peacemaking. Um, I'm leaving tomorrow to take a group down south to do a civil rights pilgrimage. Yeah. So that's just kind of where my ministry kind of <laughs> like flowed. And I'm really grateful to be in the space to have these conversations. Well, I'm really grateful to have you here because I think that you're, um, book has touched on so many, I mean, you've already intimated at some of them. Um, I think there are a lot of white people who in whether it's the past year or the past 10 years have just started saying, okay, I really need to pay more attention to the racial injustices, to my role in it, to what it means to be white. And I'm confused and I'm hurt and I'm defensive and I'm mm -hmm. just asking lots of questions. Um, and I want to, and on some level, have the capacity to withdraw because yeah. it's really uncomfortable and scary. And so having some spaces where it's still going to be uncomfortable and scary, but you're not going to be condemned um, seems, and where there's a promise of, uh, you know what, if we do this together, guess what we get to do? We get to make peace. <laughs> I mean, that's mm -hmm. a really, that's yeah. a really awesome, yeah. that's a really awesome pro promise. So I want to talk about anti-racism for a minute. Um it's a word and an idea that, at least for me, 
is relatively new. I think that's true, again, for a lot of white people. Uh, but it has come into more of the mainstream of American life in the past few years. Yeah. It sparked a lot of controversy. There are, you know, books like How to Be an Anti-Racist or White Fragility that uh, you mentioned in your book that, again, have been uh, sparking a lot of white people to, quote unquote, do the work to understand yeah. racism and whiteness and all of these things. Um, and yet I think it has also sparked controversy in terms of people feeling ashamed and guilty and like, what am I supposed to do? Apologize for who I am? You know, those types of questions. So yeah. I think you do a wonderful job throughout your book of saying you are fully on board with anti-racism, like you're about that, but that all of the tactics that some anti-racist systems, programs, books, you know, seminars, et cetera, have employed are not peacemaking tactics. And so I'd love for you to talk about what are some of the more like critical um, anti-racism policies and practices? How are those harmful? And then what does it mean to be an anti-racism peacemaker? There is a distinction mm -hmm. between the type of anti-racism that you are advancing. Um, and I'd love to talk a little bit about those two ways of, of moving in the world. Yeah. So the way I describe it in the book and, and, the, and the very first caveat that I make whenever I do this description is that I, I want to be really clear that every Black leader or Black educator or, or BIPOC educator on anti-racism um, bring their whole selves to this work. And so they do this work um, with their, their core convictions, with their theological frameworks, even with their North Star in mind. And so, um, and so while, while my way is different and my way has been helpful for some, I know that they have, their way is, has been helpful for others. And so um, I wanna be really clear to say that while I don't always employ those same tactics, um, I honor the work and the diligence of those BIPOC leaders and recognize that um, I've learned from them in some ways, and I've had a lot of clarity on how I want to do this work. But for me, the way I describe how I came to this um, third way, if you will, of doing anti-racism that I call anti-racism peacemaking, is that I found that um, in churches that I have been a part of, um, mostly in the in the 90s and, and early aughts, um, they, whenever we talk about this stuff, whenever we talk about race and division, and uh, it's usually under this umbrella of racial reconciliation, mm -hmm. which often emphasizes scriptures like there's neither Jew nor Greek nor male nor female, um, or that Jesus came to end enmity and hostility and make unity. And there's a huge emphasis on the um, the unity aspect of race right. of racial reconciliation of like hey we're called to live in unity with each other we're called to love each other you're my brother in, in Christ you're my sister in Christ this is often where we sometimes get the unhelpful idea of like colorblind or that there's like one race um, and so what I have found when as being a black person in predominantly white spaces that would teach racial reconciliation is that there's a lot of interpersonal healing and, and peace between each other. Like I knew that the white people in my church loved me really well. Right. Here's what I didn't know. I didn't know the white people in my church understood the systems that I deal with when I'm not in church with them right. and understand the reality of my life and, um, and had any interest in dismantling uh, those systems and building something new. So as I started doing the work of, of, of coming into my own as a black woman and and wanting to build a world that was safe and thriving for people who look like me who look like my children um I kind of swung to the other side which is pr primarily what like I, I call it anti-racism so like what you would call what you would see um in books like how to be an anti-racist or white fragility like you mentioned this hyper awareness of the systems so like the, the North Star, so if you say the North Star of rac racial reconciliation is that, you know, hug a black friend, we're all in this together, like, you know, unity in Christ. I would say anti-racism, their North Star is burning it down, mm -hmm. like new systems, um, hold, holding white people accountable, um, repairing the harm to, to, to BIPOC people. Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of like really good systemic work 
on this end. Mm -hmm. But often what I found is that I was encouraged to not really care about white people or their feelings or that if a white person was legitimately having, uh, was experiencing emotional trauma in doing this work, well, it's fine, it's good. Like they, that, that, that's part of this work. And that just didn't sit well with me either because I have such a framework that we are all made in the image of God, we're all beloved. And I know that I know that for some of my white brothers and sisters, they have worked really, really hard to get to the place of being beloved and knowing that they're loved by God and knowing that they're made in the image of God. And then when they start doing this work, there's there's this expectation that they have to take on this shame or, or self-hatred in order to fully enter this work. And if they don't, then they're being sent, they're centering or they're being selfish or whatever. And that just didn't sit right with me either. So I had to go through this journey of kind of figuring out um, what works for me and what has worked for me is doing what I call anti-racism peacemaking, which is an active, um, in con an active commitment to, to dismantling the systems of this world that continually oppress people of color that reinforce white supremacy culture, which is this idea that white people are better and that their ways of, uh, like, are, are better and that they're, they, they should thrive and at the expense of people of color. Mm -hmm. So I'm actively anti-racist, but I'm, act, I'm a peacemaker too. And so anti-racism peacemaking chooses to use tech, 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 techniques, sorry, tactics <laughs> and techniques <Yeah. laughs> that are explicitly nonviolent, that are rooted in empathy and that move us towards the realization of becoming the beloved community. And I describe the beloved community as a community of people who own their belovedness, proclaim each other, who own their belovedness and proclaim each other's belovedness. And if we can get to that place, I feel like if I really care about your belovedness, I'm going to invite you into this work and listen to you and be patient with you and love you. But if you care about my belovedness, then you're going to understand that there are systems that are continually oppressing me, like police brutality or like school systems. And you're going to do what you can to, to to change those systems so that I can move through this world as a beloved. Um, so that's my North Star, it's the beloved community. And it's really rooted in this idea that I am a peacemaker and I am anti-racist and I can be both. Mm. Thank you so much for that. I have a couple of quotations from your book that I noted that just are gonna underline what you just said, but I wanna read them here. Um, this is a really short one. I've seen so many white people reject their belovedness thinking they're rejecting white supremacy which I think just speaks to what you were just saying. Um, and then this is a longer one uh, where you write, you white pe peacemaker are not just white. You are not the stories of oppressors and the master's whip. You are not the greed that ended reconstruction after the civil war. You are not Jim Crow terrorism or prejudiced neighbors. You are not the school to prison pipeline. You are not police brutality. And you go on giving all sorts of examples here. You white person are beloved, a fellow peacemaker who is caught up in a system of white supremacy come, let's have a meal together. So again, I think those words just echo what you just um, described. And you also give a number of examples in the book of stories of your own encounters where you've had to put peacemaking into action um, in terms of not only your own belovedness, so like retaining your own sense of self-worth and care, but also the belovedness of someone who might be even actively opposing you. And I wondered if you um, have any of those stories from the book that you'd be willing to share here. Um, either, I mean, I remember one from a civil rights um, journey that you took with some white people, one with your son's coach, um, one in thinking about um, the death of Ahmaud Arbery. Those are the ones that came to mind for me, but really anything you'd like to share. I'd just love to give an example for people. Yeah. So I have a chapter in the book called you, Your Name is Not Racist, It's Beloved. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that chapter for me, um, I, I wrote that chapter as I was reflecting on um, the day that I saw the Ahmaud Arbery video, the, the, his murder, the video of his murder. Um, and as we know, it happened in January, it happened earlier in the year, but um, it wasn't released until later. Um, yeah. I believe it was released um, in May, mm -hmm. early May, because <laughs> at the end of May, George Floyd was murdered. Um, and so I, I, I had posted something about how, um, how, I, how disgusted I was and how disturbed I was and how um, I couldn't get past the idea 
that this was somebody who was just out on a Sunday run, you know, um, and he was hunted down and he was shot um, by a father and son, um, one who was a former police officer. And I, I just posted um, that. And in that post, I really wrestled with how I was going to share this on Instagram. Instagram is so tricky because I never know like what is the right image to fully convey these ideas. But I posted three different things. I posted um, a, a conversation between Toni Morrison um, and uh, an interview with Toni Morrison where she just talks about how the how racism is as 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 detrimental. She used the word deleterious, but like she how not it's not only detrimental to people of color to Black people who suffer because of racism. It's is detrimental to the people who enact racist ideas and policies who are caught up in the system of, of hatred or even ambivalence about the, the violence towards black and brown people. And then the next thing I posted was some kind of calls to action that I found. And then the last thing I posted was a picture of um, the McMichaels, um, father and son, um, after a after a hunting trip, so they were all in their camo. They had their guns. I think I can't I can't remember exactly, but there's a picture of them, and that was really important for me because part of my nonviolent peacemaking um, practices um, is to hold on to the humanity of people, to recognize that Jesus died for every human being, and if he died for them and they matter, they should matter to me too. And so sometimes when I am struggling with loving my enemy, which is what Jesus calls me to do in the Sermon on the Mount. I will go and look at pictures of them mm. and I will um, spend time creating a, a backstory about them. So I, I looked at this picture of this father and son and thought about like, they maybe had a really wonderful day together. You know, and they maybe shared some interesting stories and they laughed together. Like these are two people who did a really horrible thing. So I shared all those and I really struggled with those three pictures. But um, what I had noticed, and this typically happens sometimes, is sometimes I, I will see white people who are doing anti-racism work will signal that they care about this work so mm -hmm. much that they will say hurtful or angry things about the white people in those pictures. Um, and I understand where that anger comes from and I know understand where that impulse comes from, but that just, that just wasn't the kind of space I wanted to host online. Um, and so what I ended up doing on Facebook, because you know how Instagram sometimes shares over to Facebook, this didn't happen on Instagram, it happened on Facebook, where I just basically, there is, um, and I, I listened to the book, um, some of the things that people were saying about the McMichaels. Um, but then I just commented and said that we're not gonna do that here, that these are people who Jesus loves and I'm not going to undermine my peacemaking by attacking them. And I do want them to be held accountable for their, for their crime. And I do want them to have a reckoning with their own um, bias and their own hatred. And I, I do want their, their hearts to be changed. I deeply believe that nobody is too far gone, but I'm not going to use um, violent tactics or violent words to get to a place of peace. I don't believe that. I only believe, I believe violence only begets violence. It doesn't beget peace. Um, and so that was one of the spaces where I kind of yeah. had to do that work of, um, here's my standards. This is how I can, um, how I can proclaim their belovedness, but also how I can maintain my standard of, of loving out of that deep place of belovedness. Because I know that God loves me and I know that God, um, God was grieving alongside with me. Um, and I don't, I don't need to say hurtful things about white people to have that validated. Um, and I actually feel like for me, it's a really dangerous place to get into, to, um, to attack white people who are, who are blind to this or who are willfully ignorant to it. Um, and so that was, that was one of those spaces where I had to choose um, anti-racism peacemaking over retributive anger or violence. Right, right. Absolutely. Um, I want to get back to the idea of belovedness, but before I do that, I, uh, feel like it might be a good time to ask about your just living in St. Paul, which is to say essentially Minneapolis right now, yeah. because you have lived there for a couple of years now, which is to say through the murder of George Floyd, through the protests last summer, through the events of these past few weeks, both with yeah. Derek Chauvin's conviction as well as Dante Wright's death. And I would love to just um, ask you, what has it been like to practice peacemaking in your city and in your context right now? Yeah, 
Um, you know, it. so what's funny is when we were in LA, Philando Castile was shot um, in Falcon Heights, which is like a, a small little suburb, not really a suburb, like a small little area, um, literally like seven or eight minutes from my home. So very mm-hmm. close. Um, and that was a real, um, that was a real important moment for me in understanding um, the importance of doing anti-racism work and it being a part of my spiritual formation that I just couldn't um, ignore it um, or or I couldn't, I just couldn't ignore talking about this. There was something, um, I think it's just a cumulative uh, effect of so many brown, black and brown lives lost and then kind of just scrolling on and seeing Philando murdered uh, just really, uh, really shook me. And so I always had in the back of my mind that um, that we would end up in the Midwest and possibly end up in the Twin Cities for a whole bunch of reasons. Mm-hmm. But then when that happened, I thought um, we, we would probably end up there um, mm-hmm. because there was a part of me that really wanted to be a part of what the church was doing in this city. Hmm. Um, so, but then things kind of happened. This was back when we were in LA, like I said. So things kind of happened. My husband ended up leaving his associate role and, and, and accepting a call here. Um, and, and when we moved here, one of our close friends was like, yeah, this city needs more peacemakers because we're in the middle, we're, we're she said something like, we're like, it's a powder keg of racial tension here. Like, it, and um, and my husband's white, so you know we talk about race and anti-racism quite a lot, just to figure out how we can you know be a healthy interracial couple. Um, so when George Floyd happened, um, I was I had written like two thirds of Dear White Peacemakers, and it mm-hmm. was truly like a how-to book. It was um, you know it was more here here are some definitions here are some key moments and it was like it was a very one of those kind of books then George Floyd happened and my husband and I went to several protests and one of the things that I just the Lord just kept having me pay attention to was all the new all the white people for whom this is very very new and yet their hearts are incredibly broken and how they were in such a tender place because they're experiencing this trauma in a new and deep way that they have maybe not been equipped to deal with it. Um, and I also have this strong sense of um, there is going to be a need to call in um, and create space to have these conversations that's not predicated on tragedy and death. Mm. Um, I even say, I even said to my husband on the, on a drive home from one of these protests, like, do you think that they'll still be a they'll still be interested in this when there's not like another death, another shooting, will they still be interested? And my husband was like, some will and some will. And for me, I was like, I, we've got to find a way that's rooted, that's something that's a way to do this work that's rooted in something life-giving and hopeful and not um, relying on more black tragedies. Right. And so the book then completely changed. And I know I freaked my editor out like so bad. <laughs> when I was like, it's a, it's a completely new thing. Um, Cause my deadline, it was like, it was May when George Floyd happened. My deadline was eight, was August. Oh wow. And I was like, um, it's a new book. <laughs> so, We're starting over. It's completely start over. And really uh, what, what came from me paying attention to the white people in my life who were responding to, um, George Floyd's murder, who were having new conversations, who were having maybe the same conversations over and over again with their family members who were feeling overwhelmed. I sat with one friend and she was like, I'm just so exhausted. And this was a friend who like went to all the rallies, who was posting all the time. And I was like, it is okay to rest. Like you are a human being. And like, if you're going to do this work for the long haul, which you've got to have a long haul view of this work, you've got to take care of yourself. And I just, and she broke down crying because I just don't think that that's something a lot of white anti-racists are hearing is that you have got to take care of yourself. You're not decentering, you're not decentering the work um, if you take care of yourself. And if you're afraid that you won't be able to stay in this work, unless you continue working yourself, hustling for it, then we have, an, we have to have another conversation about why you're doing this work um, and what's your North Star and how can that be life-giving and hopeful for you? 
Which does actually bring us back to this concept of belovedness because I really resonated resonated <laughs> deeply <laughs> with <laughs> you have an insistence that the only way the work of peacemaking can happen, especially over the long term, is through an understanding of ourselves as God's beloved ones. And really crucial to that is this sense of self-care. And I'm wondering what that looks like for you and what you think what it means to stay rooted in belovedness for you, but also for white peacemakers. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I used to um, sum a two on the Enneagram. I don't know how mm. familiar you are. I, I'm ago. a one. <laughs> okay. so. so I used to really take a lot of pride in how present I can be for others. Mm. Yeah. And um, you know, you've heard that adage, like you should talk to yourself like you talk to your best friend. I had to start being like, you should take care of yourself like you would take care of other people. Mm. Because I am so good because I've just cultivated that in, in me for so many years. I'm so good at anticipating what somebody could need. Like I could yeah. meet somebody and like within a, like within a short amount of time, I could anticipate, oh, they're ready to have their glass refilled or, you know, whatever. Um, I mean, if you read the book, it's like, it's, I feel like it's just like a two, like, like all of my two-ness. Because <laughs> so, I'm like, come, sit down, you're in my house. Like, right. really, like, I have to create that like space of comfort and come sit down, like be okay. Just, you know, being Oshida. Yeah. Um, and so part of belovedness for me is doing really practical things like getting my hair done, you know, or getting a pedicure. Like I feel really special when I can have somebody take care of me mm -hmm. um, and I don't have to take care of myself. And, um, you know, I have some, this might sound a little controversial, but there are some black friends that I, um, that I turn to, um, to be able to just kind of have like black only spaces or black only conversations yeah. where I can just be like, there's something really beautiful and good about our culture and about our community. And not to not, you know, not to say like, I don't love my white friends, but like when I'm constantly in these spaces, I can forget that, like be at peace with myself as a black woman. And so I do have these, you know, these check-in moments where I'm just like, let's just talk about the culture girl you know, <laughs> or like, like, tell me how, how parenting is working for you or how are you doing your hair? Or, you yeah. know, did you read this thing online? Um, and I have black friends that I process things and that feels like a special gift of belovedness um, because she's beloved as a black woman and I'm beloved as a black woman and we get to reaffirm that to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a huge part of belovedness for me is honesty. And mm -hmm. so if you follow me online, I don't, have a problem with telling people like I'm exhausted and I'm not posting today or <laughs> like hey like I do these breath prayers in the morning on on my social um and it's like sometimes two three times a week depending on what my schedule can allow um and sometimes if I if I just don't feel well or awake or I like um you know we've had a new diagnosis in my family my one of my kids was diagnosed with type 1 diabetic and so mm. I was like not getting enough sleep because I was paying attention to his blood sugar all night yeah. like I, I I'm honest with with people that I'm I'm human and I need rest yeah. and um and I know that for leaders to say that that's that's uh, I think it's kind of profound for some people to hear a leader just in general say that but I think it's really really important for my predominantly white audience to hear me as a black woman say oh no, I value myself enough that I have to rest and I'm not always going to keep, you know, pushing myself harder because I'm beloved and I don't have to earn my worth and I don't have to prove anything to God and I'm not going to do that for you because that's, I feel like that would undermine your capacity for owning your belovedness. So. For me, one of the, I'm certainly still on a journey to understand my own belovedness as well, but one of the most profound um, ways for me to understand it has been through our daughter Penny who has Down syndrome because when she was first born I really needed to understand what does it mean for her to be beloved mm -hmm. and what does it mean and how can I understand that myself as well and I found that one of the ways for me to understand that was actually in thinking about limitations or needs and not just saying oh she's limited and needy 
But, oh, so am I. And I think, Mm -hmm. again, as like a white, able-bodied, educated person, I had been so conditioned to pretend like I don't have needs. It's not true. But to recognize that actually when I admit my needs to God and to other people, that is what allows people to demonstrate love for me. Also, um, for me to demonstrate love for myself and not having to er strive and earn and prove. Um, And so I just think it's so interesting the way in which being able to rest, being able to be needy and limited and honest, all those things you just said, actually almost reinforces or can reinforce that sense of belovedness. Mm -hmm. Within all of that, so one thing I was thinking about when I was reading your book um, and just some of the other books I've been reading and I've been again, just thinking about this from the perspective of a white, educated, you know, stable, all these things, privileged person. So I've been thinking about the difference between, if there is a difference between comfort and care. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to explain what I'm thinking about. So I have a lot of comfort in my life, just by, I can buy more or less, you know, not a yacht, but I can buy Mm -hmm. what I need in order to make myself comfortable. And I've been conditioned, I think, in life to not be uncomfortable. And when I do feel discomfort, I think I move really quickly, almost instinctively towards what will make me comfortable or towards what will numb that discomfort. So Mm -hmm. I do that through overworking because I can just plow through and like not notice the feelings. Or I can do that through alcohol, through food, through Netflix, through social media, right? Like all of those things can either numb or just kind of ignore discomfort. But I also, what I was thinking about is like, okay... So in order to ignore discomfort, I'm not caring for myself with any of those things, right? Like drinking another glass of wine, staying up late, scrolling through Instagram or working too hard. None of those things are actually caring for myself. They're all avoiding discomfort, but they're not care. Um, And I think sometimes, well, I guess what sometimes when I'm avoiding discomfort, it is to get out of engaging with the pain, grief, anger, hurt, injustice in the world and specifically that many of my black and brown brothers and sisters have no choice but to experience every day. Mm -hmm. And so I've been trying to think about how I can care for myself, but not avoid discomfort, right? Mm -hmm. Like entering into those painful spaces in love and self care, but not with this like avoiding discomfort. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. It makes total sense. So, you know, I used to, um, I, I taught a class called Reconciling Love on, you know, anti-racism, peacemaker, make peacemaking. And, um, and I had a conversation with somebody who was sort of just saying to me, like she has, like she wants to have all these hard conversations with her, her family who don't believe that race is an issue they're very much under the race racial reconciliation umbrella of like we're all, we're all one human race and mm-hmm. even saying white or even saying black like saying you know racial identity that's causing division and so she was having these she was explaining to me that she's having these conversations and that she would just get so upset and like she just wouldn't know what to say and so she just kept pushing and kept pushing and so I suggested to her I said okay well how about the next time you have those conversations um, with your, um, because what, what I what I sensed for her was that she was trying to push past the discomfort, but she was actually like putting herself in a place of like emotional and emotional and physical exhaustion. Like she just, mm-hmm. and she, then she wasn't thinking straight and then she would get really mad and say something she didn't mean or, and then the conversation would spin out and then she would walk away. And she'd be like, mm-hmm. why did I do that? And then she just felt like she was like, not so, not paving a good way for like the next conversation and all that. And so I was like, well, what if you said this? I'm like, what if you said um, in a conversation with your family members, like they say something that's really like, that feels really um, unhelpful or they, they say something that's racist. I want to stop here real quick, uh, Amy Julia, because I want to I wanna make this distinction before I finish this. I don't call white people racist because I don't like attaching that word to somebody who's beloved. But I will say that ideas and words and systems are influenced by by racism or white supremacy. So when I say that her family said something racist, I'm not calling her family racist, but I'm saying like maybe the thing that they said was was influenced by racist ideas. Okay, so if I say, so I say to her, going back to the story, so so say they say something that's racist, you can say to them, like what you just said 
really makes me sad because I think that you don't realize how hurtful that thing that you just said is. And I'm really grieving because I know so many brown and black people who, if they heard you say that, like I, like they would, they would be weeping. Like they would be so offended. And I don't think that you want to offend somebody. So I think that maybe I need to take a break and kind of think about what you just said and maybe kind of get my brain, get my thoughts together. And then I'll come back and maybe share with you a little bit about why what you just said was really hurtful if you still want to hear. But I just don't know that I can continue having this conversation with you unless we have a conversation about what you just said. Instead of just telling them like, what you said is wrong and then and they keep pushing back and saying, no, it's not. I was like, what if you just called in the moment that like, this is what I'm feeling. And I think I need a break. Like, I don't have to keep pushing this conversation. Um, and that was so, for her, she just didn't, because I think in her mind, it was, I've got to keep at it. I've got, yeah. like, I've got to get them to understand. And I, here I was a black person saying, like, if you keep pushing that way, you're exhausting yourself. You're exhausting them. You're not moving forward in this conversation. Right. So maybe you have to have a little bit more patience and you have to show your humanity a little bit and saying like, gosh, that just really hurts. Like when you say all lives matter, like that really hurts because I'm seeing all these black people for whom their lives don't matter. And I really got to think about that a little bit. And so maybe we just table this conversation and, you know, I gave that to her and I have, honestly, I haven't heard back from her. So I can't say like I had a, like a woohoo moment, but I could tell in watching her process what I was saying, she was like, oh, that's a way for, I could tell she was taking it as, oh, that's a way for me to care for myself as I'm doing this work of like, I don't have to keep pushing in these conversations where somebody is resistant um, and I don't have to front like I have it all figured out. I can just mm -hmm. be honest with my humanity. So that's one suggestion that, yeah. I offered, uh, that I offered. But I think that there is something about that comfort versus um, care piece um, that I want to kind of touch on is that I talk a lot about the idea of white supremacy culture and it's the, the culture that we that we are that I guess a lot of us would recognize as American culture really because it's really rooted in like data and status and strength and comfort mm -hmm. um and so there is this sense of um when what I've noticed is that when a white person does this work and they want to push past like their sense of discomfort oftentimes it's because it's they have like some sort of goal or some sort of mm. like standard that they're trying to meet to prove themselves mm. worthy and that's what I was noticing with this person so that she had to, she was she was trying to tell me the story that she was like see 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 look like see I'm doing the work and I was like actually like that's hustle culture that's white supremacy culture mm -hmm. making you feel like you have to meet some sort of standard what I really want you to do is to be beloved and human in these conversations mm -hmm. because the only way we're going to um, we're going to create a world where black and brown people are treated as human is if we all bring our full humanness to this world to this work um, and so I love that and I think that is um, a really insightful you know I, I, it's, it's striking to me just how much that sense of what's the goal? How am I going to get there? And then even, I mean, I was having a conversation with a friend the other day who was like, oh, well, doing this doesn't check the box of anti-racism. And my friend was like, you know, if you're trying to check the box, then you're not doing anti-racism work. Like, I mean, that was her response was like, there's something wrong with even just the idea of checking the box as opposed to I'm going to get it wrong. I am not doing it all at once, but I am endeavoring day by day to engage in a loving um, work in the world that does dismantle to the degree that I can white supremacy, racism, injustice in, in our land. Um, yeah. Well, we're coming to the end of our time, but I do wonder if you have any, you know, for the people who you were seeing last June, kind of in the wake of um, George Floyd's murder and the people who you wrote the book for, do you have any sense of um, first steps or, you know, here's here's a way to start entering in to your belovedness, into peacemaking, um, yeah. into this work without getting, um, yeah, completely overwhelmed or swallowed by it um, in a way that allows for a 
really lifelong commitment to the way of um, of shalom, of peace, um, mm-hmm. as you were describing before. Yeah. So I think the first thing. Um, so there. Are, well, let me let me give you like maybe three small things. Three is free. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think the very first thing is I I deeply believe that stories change the world, mm. and so you know when. And I'm just going to assume that this that that if you are into this work or you're just not thinking about it, it's probably because it was tied to some recent tragedy like Dante Wright or the, or George Floyd, um, Breonna Taylor, something like that. Um, or it might be tied to maybe a black like your like a black friend in your life is deeply grieving and is now mm-hmm. more vocal about this, and you're like, wait, what? Um, so I think that the first thing is make space to learn the stories of BIPOC people, mm-hmm. whether that is the black friend in your life who um, who will is willing to sit with you and share how she processed the verdict. I have a whole part of my book where I um, talk about how to invite some invite a black friend out to have these conversations. Um, if there isn't anybody in your life like that, which I know that that's a reality for some, um, you know, begin listening to podcasts, begin right. find, finding YouTube videos, like learning about the stories of, of Black people and not just our stories of tragedy, which there are, but also our stories of of, of joy. And, yeah. um, and so just to kind of get out of your white centered worldview to understand kind of how we move through the world Mm -hmm. um and also I think that's that'll be super helpful in going back to the thing I said at the beginning of our conversation that there's such a diversity among black people you'll start to hear and learn different things from them Mm -hmm. and I and I say start with stories and then I I would say find a a black leader um or a person of color a BIPOC leader um, who is talking about anti-racism that you can learn from. And that's why I say like, there's so many of us out there. Maybe I'm somebody that you will listen to and learn yeah. from. Great. Like, um, but there are so many, there's Austin Cheney Brown. There's Maisha T. Hill. Like there's so many of us, um, Rachel Cargill. Like there's so many of us out here. And so um, Natasha Morrison. So go and find and then learn, follow them and learn from them. Um, and then I think the other thing that you, the last thing that you need to do is, or what I would encourage you to do, is to really um, do some intentional work of owning and acknowledging your belovedness. And I know that sounds so really weird, but I think that oftentimes we don't see the humanity of others because we've neglected the humanity in ourselves. Mm. And so if we if you can start cultivating spaces where you can say, what does it mean to be beloved? What does it mean to be like, what is the weight of Jesus dying on the cross for, for me? What does that mean? And, and how, can I, how can I accept that gift? And then how can out of the abundance of gratitude and acknowledgement from that gift, love others? I think um, doing some work around belovedness is really important. And I, I always suggest doing that work with a trusted pastor or a spiritual director or a friend reading Life of the Beloved together, um, exploring mm-hmm. these concepts of being like, I'm beloved. I think it's so, I cannot emphasize this enough. I think it's so important for white people to not feel um, less than or feel like they have to beat themselves up in doing this work. Um, I said this to my friend the other day, like, I don't want you to set yourself on fire to keep me warm because mm-hmm. that's not that's not the world I want to live in. Um, and so I would say those three things, learn stories, find, the, find a leader mm-hmm. and practice your belovedness. I think even about, I was struck by this um, sometime recently that uh, before Jesus begins his public ministry, before he's tempted in the desert and proves himself in any way, the first moment we have of his adult life is before anything has happened God saying this is my beloved son and I just thought oh that's such a good reminder to me (laughs) that the belovedness comes first and everything else comes from there and if I do not return to that 
I mean, all the time, then um, I will either burn out or hurt people or manipulate or try to control or just, uh, you know, all of, I can just name more and more things that will go wrong if I don't continue to try to return to that place for myself. But also, as you said, that is what gives me the eyes to see who my beloved um, fellow human beings are as I go through the world as well. I will just say this because I, I, for some, um, you know, beloved, this feels scary because you're, there might be a fear of like, uh, well, like, am I, am I just contributing or practicing more white supremacy because I'm white and I'm running around here saying I'm beloved. But what I have found, I'm not afraid of that because what I have found is that when we understand our belovedness apart from anything that we did, like that God looks at us and says, you're beloved and you didn't have to do a single thing. Then I feel like that, that really does level the playing field in this really beautiful way where I don't have a desire to lord over you um, anything because you're a beloved as much as I'm a beloved. And my hope and desire is that as a white person, when you own your belovedness, then you start to see, like I said earlier, the ways that this world is set up that prevent me from fully living into my belovedness. And so you want to make that you want you want to make that happen you want to you want to participate in that and um and so I I, for me I just really feel like belovedness can be the great equalizer that Mm -hmm. we need in this world Mm -hmm. Mm. well I think that's the right place to end this conversation (laughs) (laughs) Um, thank you so much and again um I will we will make sure in the show notes to direct people not only to your book but also to your social media because you do a beautiful job there um and you. you know we We'll be really grateful for whatever else you put out into the world in the future. So thank you for being here. This was fun. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for listening to Love is Stronger Than Fear and Happy New Year, friends. I do hope and pray that this upcoming year may be one filled with the peace that comes from believing that love is stronger than fear. (laughs) 